Portis, what's that? You know what a turtle is? Of course. Same thing. Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind. About your mother? Your mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. Is this what you think of when you hear the word Frankenstein? Well, you're wrong. Frankenstein was conceived in a drunken bed in 1816 when this woman, Mary Shelley, and her partner, Percy Bysshe Shelley, that's right, Percy Bysshe Shelley, were visiting George Gordon Lord Byron. That prick. A volcano exploded the previous summer, which meant that the weather really sucked. So instead of going outside, they spent their time writing ghost stories, and Mary Shelley came up with Frankenstein. I'm not making that up. The impact this book has had has been nothing short of colossal. Among other things, it's the first piece of fiction to really make use of the mad scientist character. Frankenstein is the story of a foolish scientist who makes a distorted creation and fails to take responsibility for it. Dr. Frankenstein rejects the monster and casts it out as an orphan. The monster raises himself and tries to be good, even saving people's lives, but ultimately the world rejects him for his deformity. The monster finds his creator and asks the doctor to make him a wife. He promises that he and his family will live in a remote jungle and won't harm anyone. When the doctor screws it up, the monster decides to take revenge and starts killing all of Frankenstein's loved ones. When the doctor dies of pneumonia, the monster decides to burn himself alive so that no more suffering will come from his life. Just for the record, Frankenstein is the name of the doctor, not the monster. The monster has no name, which is always kind of badass. Unlike the monster we know today, the creation in Shelley's original novel was actually quite clever and eloquent. I was benevolent. My soul glowed with love and humanity. But am I not alone? Miserably alone? You, my creator, abhor me. What hope can I gather from your fellow creatures who owe me nothing? They spurn and hate me. Shall I not then hate them who abhor me? I will keep no terms with my enemies. I am miserable, and they shall share my wretchedness. One reference for Shelley's novel was Milton's Paradise Lost. In the epic, both Satan and Adam hold some animosity towards their creator God because they made their life, like, not good or whatever. But Frankenstein crystallized the concept, and it has been retold many times. In Thomas Edison's 1910 version, the monster is destroyed by true love. Thomas Edison was actually a pretty big jerk. He stole other people's patents, and he held something of a monopoly in the interactive entertainment industry. That's why a lot of Jews who were involved in the industry went to a small, unknown town called Hollywood, California, to get away from him. Of course, when most people think about Frankenstein nowadays, they remember the 1931 film with Boris Karloff as the monster. <laughs> It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! In the name of God! Now I know what it feels like to be God! And of course Mel Brooks's version is hilarious. But the real legacy of the Frankenstein story lies in less obvious places, like Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Blade Runner's an awesome movie, and I don't have time to get into it. But a scientist, Terrell, creates a bunch of replicants, which are basically like androids. And one of their leaders, Roy Batty, gets a little pissed off at him. Surprised you didn't come here sooner. It's not an easy thing to meet your maker. But what seems to be the problem? Death. Death. Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of my jurisdiction. You... I want more life. Father. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Roy. I've done questionable things. Also extraordinary things. Revel in your time. Nothing the god of biomechanics wouldn't let you in heaven.
Quite often, the rebelling monster orphan character is used as a way of warning people about the dangers of advancing science too quickly. Blade Runner was about the danger of technology and computers, and also the anxiety surrounding the question, what separates humans from machines, if anything? Another scientific issue which is addressed using the orphan creation character is that of gene manipulation, such as seen here in the good Final Fantasy movie. Shinra used their power to try and stop anybody who got in their way. Shinra had a special group of warriors called Soldier, and all of the soldiers had Genova souls put inside them. Genova was a calamity that fell from the sky a long, long time ago and tried to destroy the planet. Anyway, there was one soldier named Sephiroth who was better than the rest. But when he found out about the terrible experiments that made him, he began to hate Shinra. And then, over time, he began to hate everything. The monster baby in Eraserhead isn't a scientific creation. It represents the unwanted child. Oh man, there's more to it than that, but I can't think about Eraserhead right now, I'm sorry. In the recent movie Beowulf, the Grendel monster represents many things, including his father's corruptibility, infidelity, and pride. The arrogant Beowulf kills the Grendel monster, but he also falls into Angelina Jolie's trap, just like his predecessor, Hrothgar. That's an awesome name. I know that underneath your glamour, you're as much a monster as my son, Grendel. My. I've been trying to cut back on the phallus jokes, but why does Angelina Jolie have a phallus? That's just weird. You took a son from me. Give me a son, brave thing. Beowulf consents. His son's a bit cooler than Hrothgar's, but in the end they have to kill each other, and the circle of violence continues. The monster revenger character V, in V for Vendetta, is orphaned by a corrupt political system. I don't know if I can make that sound interesting. You're getting back at them for what they did to you. What was done to me was monstrous. And they created a monster. Next. This one kind of blew my mind when I started thinking about it. Here we see Liam Neeson. Oh, he was in Batman and the other one. Talking to Shmi Skywalker, Anakin's mother. The force is unusually strong with him. That much is clear. Who was his father? There was no father. Okay, wait one second here. Anakin Skywalker doesn't have a father. But what about the, uh... And, and the Y chromosome and... Eh... I carried him, I gave birth, I raised him. I can't explain what happened. Can you help him? I don't know. I assume she's not lying, because she didn't lie about her name being Shmi. Ah, Shmi! Where be your belly button? I'm including Vader on this list because his father is the Force, whatever that means, and like these other monsters, he really is an agent of destruction. I think it's fair to draw a parallel here with one individual being betrayed by their supposedly benevolent creator. And although life has treated him poorly, and he has accumulated a lot of sin, if you will, he does destroy himself in the end, in order to restore the balance. That, and the fact that this is almost exactly the same as the scene in the 1931 Frankenstein movie. No! That's it for now. Next time, I'll wrap things up with vampires, comic books, and serial killers.